He's been making sense of science for us for 40 years. And every year he takes your questions. And I love questions like this, where you look at something in everyday life and you say, you know, like, why is it like that? That's how science works. Questions like, why are the planets round? Want to know the answer? Well, we sat down with CBC's science correspondent and host of Quirks and Quarks, Bob McDonald, for a special two-part one-on-one. And tonight, here's a special preview. So let's get some answers. So here we are again. <laughs> Good to see you again, Peter. Good to see you, and great questions yeah, yeah, this year, like terrific. some really wonderful ones, and lots of them. You're so right. you know what that means. Well, we you got to be fast. Okay. we got to be fast, we've got to get right at it. <laughs> so uh, let's do that. Um, Bev from Pembroke, Ontario. I've noticed that each time a volcano erupts, it always seems to be followed by an earthquake soon after. In your opinion, is there any correlation between the two events? Uh, yes, there is. Earthquakes and volcanoes are related for two reasons. They tend to be um, clustered. They, they tend to happen in the same areas of the Earth. So there are some areas that get more earthquakes than others in volcanoes. So the west coast of North America is a crack between North America, which is a plate, and the Pacific Ocean, which is a plate. So the Earth's surface is like a big cracked egg. There's about a dozen pieces. And each of these pieces is the size of a continent. And where the pieces meet, that's where you get the activity. So North America and the Pacific Ocean are rubbing together, and that makes earthquakes, it makes volcanoes. Regina doesn't get too many earthquakes because it's in the middle of a plate. So the volcanoes are happening there, and there's famous footage from 1980 when Mount St. Helens erupted. It was getting ready to erupt. The, the magma was coming up from below, the pressure was building, but the eruption was actually triggered by an earthquake. So there are micro earthquakes that happen before a volcanic event, the geologists try to use those to predict that the earthquake is going to go off. And they were actually saying, look, Mount St. Helens is getting close. Mm -hmm. An earthquake triggered it, then it blew. And then after it blows, the magma, once the pressure is released, tends to go down so the ground settles so you can get earthquakes again afterwards, aftershocks. But you can also get earthquakes without volcanoes. So they're, they're related, but the big earthquakes are not caused by volcanoes. But earthquakes can trigger volcanoes, if you know what I mean. Okay. So the, the scale is a little different. In a word, are we getting any closer to predicting earthquakes? No, and there's a problem with that because uh, the geologists are afraid to cry wolf. Mm. Because if you say Vancouver was given a warning and there's, there's a high risk of a big quake, they keep talking about it. If, if they think one's coming and they say, okay, everybody out, you know, and people yeah. are trying to evacuate and the highways get clogged and, and accidents are happening, all kinds of horrible things, and then it doesn't happen. Everybody's going, hey, you just caused a lot of chaos there. So the, the, and then if they, they do predict it again, it's like, well, we don't believe you anymore. And then people die. <laughs> so they're very, very reluctant to do that. And it's, it's a conundrum. It's, it's a problem to try to predict these things. The best thing is to be prepared. All right, I got a couple here I want to try and whip through quickly. Skip Getzinger from Ottawa has this question. Regarding the International Space Station, I was wondering if you could tell us where the oxygen supply comes from, as well as the water that the astronauts need to live. Uh, the oxygen, they can bring up uh, oxygen uh, in tanks if they like, but they make their water and uh, some of the oxygen through electrolysis. I don't know if you remember back in uh, grade school or high school, there was an experiment you could do where you take a battery and a couple of waters, you, or wires, you put them in water and it bubbles and you're breaking the water down because water is hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. So the hydrogen comes off one, you can put it into a test tube and actually burn that, and then you get the oxygen off another one. The solar panels on the International Space Station drive it. It's got these huge solar wings the size of a football field, so it's solar powered. So they have a lot of electricity up there, and they bring up water, and that's how they make oxygen, and uh, that's how they, they live there, through electrolysis. They also have these canisters that are Russian technology, left over from the old Mir space station, and they're called candles. And they have this, uh, this chemical in them, and you actually burn them. They get hot. But one of the products of combustion is oxygen, and they use those in emergencies. If there's a fire or something breaks down, they can actually generate oxygen, and each canister makes enough oxygen for one person for one day. And in fact, they're related to the things that are in airplanes. When uh, they say, you know, when the mask comes yeah. down, you put, put your mask on first before you put a kit yeah. on. Before you, you save have, anybody else, That's right. save yourself. You have, to, you have to pull because you are activating a similar kind of canister that makes a chemical reaction to produce oxygen. It's not a big oxygen tank that's in the airplane. It's a chemical reaction that's making oxygen for you. So they have those two systems on the space station, these canisters and electrolysis using electricity. I always look at the puzzled faces of people on airlines when that announcement comes. Yeah. 
And they just can't believe they're being told that. Yeah, you, what do you mean we're going to lose oxygen? <laughs> no, 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 it, it's about... How know, do I do it? Yeah. Look after yourself first and then... Well, that's because yeah. you, you want to be awake. You want to be awake. You know, your child can't help anyone. They, 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 may, they may not know what to do, but you do. So that's why your child can put up with a few seconds of mm -hmm. not, not much oxygen, but you, you can't. It's better if you do it first, then take care of the kid because you're healthy. Here's Carol's question. There are more people on the earth than ever before. Does this mean that the earth is heavier than it was when it began? Yes, there are more people, uh, and uh, I guess there's more life than there was originally, but we are made of chemicals that came from the Earth itself. We are just very complicated chemical reactions, and so there's no net gain in mass. There's a change of energy, a change of form, but it is still the same stuff. We've come from the Earth, and we go back to the Earth, dust to dust and all of that. So, no, there is no net balance. However, the Earth is getting heavier because of dust that comes from space. We're plowing through the solar system and there's a lot of dust and dirt out there and we pick, out a, pick up about 100 tons a day of dust from space. Most of it burns up in the atmosphere. Sometimes big ones come down and we get meteors and you know asteroid kill or dinosaur killers and stuff like that. But we, so the earth is getting heavier in that respect but not because of humanity. It's all an energy balance. Next question from Hugh McCauley from Roberts Creek BC writes, why do we get bags under our eyes when we're tired? Yeah, well, I was just thinking about this as I was sitting in makeup just before coming <laughs> in here, because the first thing they do is they put the color under your eyes, right? Exactly. So there's two things that happen under your eyes is they get dark and you get baggy. The darkness is because the skin under your eyes is the thinnest skin in your body, some, almost the thinnest anywhere. Uh, it's, it's much thinner. It's, it's half the thickness of your cheeks, for example. And so that makes it transparent. You can see through it. So you can see the dark blood vessels underneath, and some Sometimes blood vessels are blue, so that's what can make them dark. And bagginess comes from, again, the fact that it's thin and it's not as strong. So as you get older, uh, if you get really tired, or if you eat a lot of salt, your eyes get puffy. And that will cause them to stretch out. But then if they're not strong, when the puffiness goes down, then the skin is just loose. It's not as strong, so it gets baggy. That's what happens with age. Uh, it can also happen with your eyelids as well. So there are lots of products out there to try to tighten them up, or you can get some cosmetic surgery. But it's just a yeah. product of age. That's just the way it is. As you say, cosmetic surgery will yeah. physically tighten it up. Right. But we don't do that. We don't do that. As no, as we're all we're au naturel tell. on CBC <laughs> yes, here. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, this came in by Twitter, Jesse Barnes from Okotoks, Alberta, and it's timely because there's a, there's a serious debate going on about the answer to this question. Is Canada carbon neutral now? consider such small population vast forests compared to other countries? Well, we do have a lot of forests and uh, our population is small, but we have some pretty serious industry in our country. And the largest single source of carbon production in North America is our oil sands production in Alberta, which is getting larger. Uh, they're expanding up north eventually and, and even into Saskatchewan. So while um, our overall production of emissions on a worldwide scale is pretty small. We're a, we're a small contributor. We have the largest point source. And also our, our fracking is producing more. And so we have to deal with that. I, th I think we have a responsibility to deal with that. The other thing that we can deal with is we have a lot of intellectual capital in our country. We're very smart. And we can lead by example and, and introduce solar and wind and alternative technologies to do that. It's going to be difficult because we rely on our fossil fuels a lot for our economy. But we've got to take care of our single emissions. So are we neutral? Not quite. We're close to it. Not quite. But we, we still got to take care of that, that responsibility. Our final question this year comes from Camrose, Alberta, from Ranny Palo. Here it is. Uh, my question for you. The great uh, big bang cataclysmic event that created our universe suggests tremendous disruption and jaggedness. But our Earth, even in our sister planets, even with the mountain ranges and trenches, essentially are round. Why are the planets round? It, it, it's really quite amazing, actually, how everything is round, but only the big things are round. Little things are not. Uh, I got some Play-Doh here to, to show how this works. So uh, it's all because of gravity. So gravity pulls towards the center. So right now, you and I are calling down in this direction. But if you go down far enough, you go about 12,000 kilometers down, you will come to whoever's on the other side of the Earth. And I think underneath, we're in Toronto right now, I think India is underneath us. So people in India right now call down this way 
because we're all calling down the center of the Earth. That's where gravity pulls. So if you have an object and you pull everything towards the middle, it's trying to get as small as it possibly can. And the smallest shape you can get with everything as close to the center as possible is a sphere. If anything's sticking out like that, the gravity will pull it down to try to make it smaller. So the smallest shape you can get is a sphere. That's why all big things become spherical. They're trying, the gravity is trying to pull it in as small as possible. If you have a smaller object like an asteroid or um, a small comet, they don't have as much mass, they don't have as much gravity, so they can be odd shaped. And that's why we're seeing these pictures from space of the, the comet, like the one that the, the lander, Philae lander went on. It was this really weird one. In fact, it looked like a, like a, a dumbbell like this because it, it was two, two odd shaped comets that came together and stuck. So it, it looked like that. It looked like a dumbbell going through space. But it didn't have a, enough gravity to pull itself together. But when you get really, really big objects, they will pull together and that's where you get the smallest shape possible. That's why soap bubbles are round as well. Surface tension is trying to make them small, which is a sphere. Last question from me. Oh, okay. You know, another, another great year of questions yeah. from, the, from viewers, as you mentioned at the top of this broadcast. Um, they always ask me, does he know all this stuff? Like, <laughs> how does he know all this stuff? It's because I've been at this a long time. <laughs> you know, I started working here at the CBC doing science documentaries in 1976. Mm. And since then, I've been talking to scientists around the world. And on Quirks and Quarks, every week, scientists tell me their stories. And it's all new stuff. So my education has come from the people who do it from who do the science. And over time, I guess some of it's stuck. <laughs> so many people think you're a scientist yourself. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm a journalist. But you're an honorary scientist. Uh, yes, yes. I've, I've got honorary <laughs> degrees. Having that closeness to so many over time yeah, through, yeah, through interviews. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinated me. And plus, uh, as far as space goes, I mean, that's my favorite topic, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's kind of a personal thing for me. So that's how I, I got a lot of it. And you just learn things as you go. Well, we're lucky you share it with us. Oh, it's a pleasure, Peter. It's always great to do this every Until year. Until next year. Okay, see you then. Thanks, Bob.